It's a pleasure to rise in the House on second reading of Bill 57 and act to end oil and natural gas exploration and drilling in New Brunswick. Mr. Speaker, six months ago, the Secretary General of the United Nations, no less, Antonio Guterres, said, we are in a fight, the fight of our lives, and we're losing. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing, global temperatures keep rising, and our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. He said, we're on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. Well, Mr. Speaker, in our province, the person who has their foot on that accelerator is the Premier. He's determined to expand the production of fossil fuels, specifically shale gas, by opening up fracking. This bill is a firm no to that ambition. As citizens in a province in one of the richest countries of the world, we have a responsibility to ensure that the Premier takes his foot off that gas pedal right now. We're in a fight for our lives, and we're losing, said the UN Secretary General Guterres. What then is our responsibility to the world, Mr. Speaker? The answer is straightforward. No new fossil fuel infrastructure. Net zero means there have to be significant declines in the use of coal, oil, and gas. It was on May 21st, 2021, that the world's leading energy organization, the International Energy Agency, announced that there can be no new oil, no new gas, no new coal development if the world is to reach net zero by 2050. Fatih Birol, the IEA executive director and one of the world's most foremost energy economists said this, if governments are serious about the climate crisis, there can be no new investments in oil, gas, and coal from now, from this year, and he was speaking in 2021. But what does this Premier intend to do? He intends to bring new investments to New Brunswick to create new gas development in our province. Clearly, he's not serious about the climate crisis. The Premier Ministre est du mauvais côté de l'histoire. Monsieur le Président, ce projet de loi est un projet de loi sur l'action climatique, une véritable action climatique, climatique implique de mettre à fin à l'expansion de la production de combustibles fossiles ici au Nouveau-Brunswick. According to the latest research, Mr. Speaker, from the World Meteorological Organization, Global temperatures are likely to breach the crucial 1.5 degree threshold by 2027. That news came out yesterday. This, they said, would send the world into uncharted territory that we've never seen before. Members will recall that countries around the world pledged under the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement to cut fossil fuel emissions significantly enough to call, hold global uh, temperatures to no higher than 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That's the scientific advice, that heating beyond that level would unleash a cascade of increasingly catastrophic and potentially irreversible impacts. The future of humanity, Mr. Speaker, hangs in the balance, and yet the WMO announces yesterday that we're likely to breach that crucial 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold in just four years from now. Mr. Speaker, this is tragically all too predictable. In 1992, the countries of the world at Rio, the Rio Earth Summit, agreed in the Climate Change Convention, which still governs climate negotiations today, in 1992, Countries of the world agreed to keep the world from heating to dangerous levels. They didn't define it. But they did say they would return the level of greenhouse gas emissions by 2000 to 1990 levels and reduce them beyond that year. Never happened. 
it wasn't for the lack of science, Mr. Speaker, the lack of evidence, it was that there were just such lucrative profits to be made from expanding fossil fuel production. Apparently, that's what the Premier wants to foster with his obsessive drive to frack and extract shale gas in New Brunswick. You know, North America, with just 6% of the world's population, has produced a quarter of all the greenhouse gas emissions clogging our atmosphere today, which will linger there for a century or more. No part of the world will come close to catching us. Given that governments and the fossil fuel industry have known the consequences of burning this scale of fossil fuels for decades, writer Bill McGibbon recently argued it could be fairly said that the climate crisis is a kind of crisis is a kind of crime North America, North America has been committing uh, as the most vulnerable in places like Somalia, Pakistan, and Vietnam die. Nous avons largement dépassé les limites de la croissance de la production et de la consommation de combustibles fossiles, ce qui entraîne une dégradation du climat. The climate crisis, Mr. Speaker, is intensifying and rapidly widening. And the fate of humanity and life on Earth does hang in the balance. Nothing is going to be the same at all. The final warning from the International Panel on Climate Change earlier this year was nothing less than a code red for humanity. So where is the urgency, Mr. Speaker? I don't see it. The Premier's determination to frack for gas is like the Easter Islanders who cut the last trees down expecting their gods to intervene to save them from themselves. Didn't happen. Didn't happen, and it's going to happen. It isn't going to happen here as the fossil fuel industry seeks ways to ensure every drop of oil and gas in the ground gets burned. In 2014, the government of New Brunswick has put in place a moratorium on the fracturation of hydraulic. This moratorium prévoyait cinq conditions qui devaient être remplies avant que nouvelle fracturation puisse avoir lieu au Nouveau-Brunswick. Ces conditions sont les suivantes. Première, un permis social. Deuxième, des informations claires et crédibles sur l'impact de la fracturation hydraulique sur notre santé, notre environnement et notre eau. Troisième, un plan qui atténue les impacts sur notre infrastructure publique et qui aborde des questions telles que l'évacuation des eaux usées. Quatrième, un processus en place pour respecter nos obligations envers tous les devoirs de consultation des Premières Nations et des peuples autochtones. Et finalement, un mécanisme en place pour s'assurer que les avantages sont maximisés pour les gens du Nouveau-Brunswick, y compris le développement d'une structure de rélevance appropriée. None of these conditions have been met almost 10 years later. And Mr. Speaker, 10 years later, the consequences of climate breakdown have become evident everywhere. Dramatic in Canada's Arctic, dramatic in the Antarctic, dramatic in Alberta, uh, Quebec, uh, Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan, BC, and the Northwest Territories and the Yukon. Again, predictable. It was decades ago that the first maps were pre uh, uh, presented from Environment Canada showing what was likely to happen in terms of changes in temperatures in our country uh, as a result of uh, increasing the rapid climate uh, warming. And uh, those regions of the country were just glowing red in those maps decades ago. And now we're seeing the results. So 10 years have passed. 
the, the, the ball has really been kicked down the road on climate action in any meaningful way, and uh, now we are in a serious emergency. With respect to fracking, though, the moratorium that was established 10 years ago was only established in regulation, Mr. Speaker, not in legislation, not in law. And that allowed the current Premier to circumvent it for the, uh, the sussex Albert County area. This bill acknowledges that New Brunswickers do not want new fracking, acknowledges the seriousness of the climate crisis, acknowledges that fundamentally the solution to the climate crisis has to be ending new development of new gas, new oil, and new coal, acknowledges that we've got to go further and farther and ban fracking and put that into law. We came close at the beginning of the minority government, Mr. Speaker, um, when the, uh, uh, the Liberals brought a bill to do that, um, but unfortunately it never came to second reading, so it didn't move forward. So here's another opportunity. Here we are at second reading. Members of the House may ask, has any other jurisdiction taken the step that this bill anticipates it would take? Well, we don't have to look very far, Mr. Speaker, just across the border, across the Van Horde Bridge, in fact, from Campbellton over to Quebec. Um, because just last year, Quebec became the first jurisdiction in the world to explicitly ban the new development, expansion of oil and gas development in its territory after decades of campaigning by citizens groups and environmental organizations. Much like New Brunswick, Quebec once had a moratorium on new fracking projects, thanks to the citizens who stood up against it then, but it was just a moratorium not, a, not law. While the fossil fuel industry had hoped the Premier of Quebec would reopen the industry, he instead banned oil and gas exploration and production outright in law. This bill, this bill, Mr. Speaker, Bill 57, gives the Premier, gives his cabinet, gives the caucus on the government side and all of us the chance to make New Brunswick a climate leader by doing the same here in our province. It would also give New Brunswick the opportunity to join the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. What's the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance? Well, it's an international alliance of governments and stakeholders led by the country of Denmark and Costa Rica together, working to facilitate the phase out of oil and gas production as we move towards 2050 and net zero, just as Quebec has. Many other jurisdictions, including, in fact, 15 Canadian municipalities, Mr. Speaker, have joined the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative, which is a global effort to foster international cooperation to accelerate and transition to green, clean energy. Cette initiative a donné lieu à la publication d'un document destiné aux décideurs politiques qui détaille les mesures que les gouvernements peuvent prendre pour réduire l'approvisionnement en combustibles fossiles et les dépendances à l'égard de ceux-ci. Il s'agit notamment de limiter l'exploration, la production et l'exportation de combustibles fossiles au moyen de moratoires et d'interdiction comme le propose le projet de loi 57. Mr. Speaker, the fossil fuel industry and their cheerleaders in governments have successfully de de delayed meaningful climate action for 30 years. That's three decades, Mr. Speaker, three decades, much of which I've been involved in this battle in one capacity or another. 30 years, and you know what? I recall, I recall in about 1992 or so, a particularly decisive moment, which could have been a turning point in Bathurst, where all the energy ministers from across Canada 
and all the environment ministers from across Canada, and the federal environment minister, Sheila Copps, the federal energy minister, Anne McMillan, assembled together in Bathurst in a hotel on a very cold day. Well, it was Bathurst in February. Um, and probably one of the very first, first climate protests in Canada occurred there in Bathurst, a little historic moment um, for uh, the member from Bathurst. Uh, and so the decision was, should or should they not establish clear targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for Canada following the Earth Summit to actually get emissions back to 1990 levels by the year 2000 and reduce them after that. And the decision was no, they wouldn't do that. 30 years ago, 31 years ago, they wouldn't do that. But one can only imagine where we would be today, Mr. Speaker, probably closer to some European countries in terms of uh, our commitment to reducing energy demand through energy efficiency and energy efficient technologies and much more dependence on renewable sources of energy and, and storage. We barely begun in this province. And the consequences of kicking climate action down the road we're seeing around Canada, everywhere. I mean, right now the fire is burning, raging really in Alberta, in the NWT and in British Columbia once again once again, in that hot zone, literally a hot zone, uh, Mr. Speaker. But we can think of the floods we've seen acro in, in, across Canada. We can think of um, something that often doesn't come to mind, but actually is a reality. Moratorium was declared on cod and ground fish, which was devastating for so many fishing families and fishing communities in our part of the world on the East Coast, Mr. Speaker. And it was thought that that moratorium would allow those stocks to rebuild so that the fisheries could once again be restored. But you know what? Because of the consequences of the climate crisis on the habitat for those ground fish in our waters, the Bay of Fundy, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the Bay of Chaleur, because of that, those populations, those stocks could not rebuild. Impossible. Not possible. So those fisheries have never come back on a commercial scale like they were because they can't. The habitat has been severely degraded. So, Mr. Speaker, real climate action means ending the growth in fossil fuel production and lowering our consumption. Now, I know, Mr. Speaker, that philosophically, um, government side, maybe some on this side, don't believe there are actually limits to growth sometimes for certain things at some point. And here, Mr. Speaker, it is clear that the growth of fossil fuel production is causing serious harm now and will cause much more serious harm in the future, rendering large areas of the world inhospitable, including large parts of our country and some uninhabitable. 50 years from now, no one's going to be able to work in the countries around the uh, tropical belt of, of, uh, of our planet. Too hot, impossible to work, and therefore impossible to support themselves and continue to live there. So that's what this bill does, Mr. Speaker. No more growth in fossil fuel production in New Brunswick. No more growth in fossil fuel production in New Brunswick. That's what we need. That's real climate action. That gets at the nub of the problem. So I hope that other members of the House will give serious consideration to moving this bill through second reading to committee stage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Natural